Hello and welcome to Kawazit's cultural program online. My name is Mark Nichols and this is the Italian Cinema Forum for 2020, our second instalment. And this week we're going to be looking at Nanni Moretti's fantastic film Aprile of 1998. April is the translation, of course, a wonderful film. And I'm going to go on record here and saying, in, in terms of my films of the 1990s, I think this is my absolute favourite and I'm here to strenuously encourage you to watch it after this introduction. Aprile is most famous in Italy, almost reaching iconic status. In fact, it's probably already a meme for one particular scene. Nanni Moretti playing himself is watching TV uh, in the lead up to the 1996 general elections in Italy and he's screaming at the television. Silvio Berlusconi is on TV going on about the corruption of the justice system and, and the left and their influence in Italy and Massimo Dilemma, the leader of the parliamentary left at that time, is saying very little, trying to keep control, not quite sure how to deal with this incredible disruptor he has on his hands in Silvio Berlusconi and Moretti's going crazy and he's screaming at the, at the television with the famous quote from the film Di una cosa sinistra, say something a little left wing, Massimo D'Alemma, please just say something vaguely progressive, even something civic. And he's screaming at the, at the television with this, with this line. And it has become uh, a, a line from the film, which as I say, has achieved an incredible status in Italian uh, cultural consciousness. For me, the film, as always, I think I always say this, is equally interesting and, and memorable for its musical score. Uh, if you've seen the film, you remember particularly the Perez Prado uh, uh, Mambo songs that are studded throughout the film. And they're, they're really important from the 1950s, the, the great Mamba tunes uh, that, that Moretti uses in this film to signal something that's really important to the film, which I'll talk a little bit about later. It also has an incredibly beautiful um, solo piano score, which, which is threaded throughout the narrative. This is by, uh, composed by the um, well-known Italian pianist and um, composer Ludovico Einaudi. Uh, a, a well-known figure, his album Giorni is, 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 is most um, popular in Italy. And, and, and so what Moretti's doing with this film is he's taking this kind of 1950s mamba songs and um, uh, kind of mixing them up, up with the Eonaldi score. And it's a beautiful mix. And, and I think really one of the most memorable parts of the film. Aprile cast and crew is interesting. This is what we often call a kind of a, a doco diary style film. And as befits that, that, that style for this film, Moretti has drawn on mainly his friends and family to um, play with him in this film. And they all play uh, themselves. Silvio Nonno, his wife, uh, of course, this film is very much about the birth of his first son, Pietro Moretti, and he, uh, he plays himself. Um, we also have a main part played in the film by regular Moretti colleague and collaborator Silvio Orlando. The cinematography, which is loose and beautiful, by Giuseppe Lanci. Angelo Nicolini edited the film, and Marta Mafucci was responsible for the design. In addition to um, Moretti's friends and family and regulars in his filmmaking it are, of course, a kind of cast of Italian politicians of the day, most of whom we see through kind of video footage of the time. Uh, we've already talked about Berlusconi. We've already talked about Massimo D'Alema. Throughout the film, we'll see Romano Prodi, Giulio Amato, Gianfranco Fini, and, of course, the infamous Umberto Bossi. We also get a little cameo at the start by uh, TV presenter, Berlusconi TV presenter, Emilio Fede. So these are familiar faces on the Italian political and media scene. And these are two very important themes for the film. Moretti himself, what do we know about Moretti? Outside Italy, I think he's probably best known for his film Caro Diario, uh, Dear Diary. It is a film of three episodes, which we, um, 
follow Moretti through three different situations. And this is where he established the kind of style that we are very much going to see in Aprile, uh, a very loose, as I call it, documentary kind of di um, diary style. And that's a really um, important influence on this film, which, which basically followed it. More recently, we, we remember Moretti um, in his work on films like uh, The Sun's Room, Stanza del Filio, a wonderful film about a psychoanalyst dealing with, um, spoiler alert, the death of, 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 his, of his son. And more recently, uh, his film um, with, um, uh, you know, some really interesting uh, kind of characters and, and, and issues to do with um, uh, his mother and the idea of motherhood. And the film is, of course, Mia Madre. So I talked a little bit about the style of Caravillario and how that influences this film. And I wanna just kind of highlight that here because I really, I think the style of Aprile, like the style of Caravillario, is one of the most important parts of the film. Very personal sort of style of filmmaking, representing a kind of a yearning for a sort of sense of artistic freedom. This is the cinema of personal expression. And it's a format that audiences have found very appealing and, and, and has made um, Moriti, I think, very popular, uh, particularly outside Italy. So the film itself, Aprile, 1998. It's a really good time to be thinking again about this film. And it's a great kind of antidote to everything that's going on at the moment, particularly in, in relation to the US elections and, and American politics in general. As we uh, lovers of Italy know, everything that happens somewhere in the world usually happens first in Italy. And I think that, it, that watching the film reminds us um, to the extent that what we are seeing uh, in the American body politic and what we've been seeing over the last four years and may continue to see on in the future uh, in the presence of, of kind of media-oriented populists like President Trump, we've seen before, of course, in the Italian context um, with Silvio Berlusconi and his various governments and prime ministerships and influence on, on, on the Italian body politic and, and reshaping, uh, you know, what is often referred to as the Second Republic um, uh, within the Italian, Italian polity. And so that idea, I think the more we rethink about Berlusconi and, and the way Moretti here directs us to think about Berlusconi in, in this, which is only one of his films dealing with that uh, venerable personage, um, we start to understand something that what we're also seeing in other media-oriented populist uh, body politics that are emerging, the United States, the United Kingdom, and, and dare I say it, possibly even in Australia itself. To describe the film is fairly simple. Its plot ranges around the elections in Italy of 1994, 1996, and Moretti's sense of obligation and responsibility to document what is going on in the Italian body politic at this important juncture in Italian history. He meets up with a French journalist colleague uh, who says, you really should do something about this in, on film. And this gives Moretti's character an incredible sense of obligation. Dobbiamo fare questo documentario. We must make this documentary, he sort of asserts to his film making team. You know, we really got to do something here. This is what we do. We make films about stuff and, and we need to capture this moment and try and understand what's going on at this apparent polarized, point of polarization in the Italian body politics. So this political and, and, and the desire to document that process um, is, 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 you know, fundamental to the film and the way it plots itself out. Constant interruptions are coming to that process by Moretti's, let's call it his true desire. He wants to make a 1950s style musical about a Trotskyite pastry chef working in a Stalinist world. And the music that we get through Perez Prado and the Mambo music uh, and, and the ideas of making this film constantly interrupt uh, Moretti in his desire to make this, you know, more serious film, perhaps. And so we get this kind of opposition between the crazy funster musical thing and, and the sort of serious film uh, critiquing the Italian body politic. The third element of, of uh, Aprile is, of course, a more personal one. Um, this film is very much about his first experience of fatherhood with the birth of his son, 
uh, Pietro, he's um, coming to understand his mother's experience of, of parenthood um, as, as he uh, experiences that himself. And also generally the film is very much about the kind of life expectations and what life is supposed to be about. So in many ways, um, we might think about Aprile in, in, in terms of kind of three issues. One, that this is a film about politics. Secondly, it's a film about the idea of personal filmmaking. And thirdly, uh, a film very much about the kind of interrogation of personal and private life. In terms of the political aspect of the film, which dominates everything, and, and, and these are all intertwined, obviously, these things, there is a very strong idea of personal frustration that Moretti is expressing and experiencing as we go through this period, uh, as Italy seems to be seemingly embracing Berlusconi and, and, and that style of Italian politics in a more dedicated way, and particularly with a certain amount of electoral success. We see these film scenes of him screaming at the television and ranting and raving at what, what, what's going on. And, and we all experience that from different perspectives, perhaps, but we all know what that's very much like. In Moretti, and it's very much him as a character, he's constructed his own persona here very, very closely, I think, to much of that we know about him. Uh, there's a very strong sense of, of, of a notion of commitment and obligation to do something about the current situation. And there are fantastic scenes where he sits there going through all these letters he's written to politicians, the letters that I never sent, you know, telling, telling his comrades in the Communist Party to, you know, get away from Stalinism and to embrace a more liberal notion and uh, foster youth within the left, left, left of politics. And these kind of ranty letters that become very much part of, of, of the scenario at a certain point. And, you know, famously, he then takes the letters. He, he's got to do something with these letters that he never sent to his communist and socialist colleagues. And so he sets up uh, a stand at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park and in Italian just reads out these crazy letters, which are all about, you know, why Emilia Romana has the best uh, social and public services in the country and, and, and Emilia Romana should be the model. And as if anyone at Hyde Park Speaker's Corner on a Sunday afternoon cares about that. So in a sense, the political um, inquiry of this film is very much dominated by the kind of idea of futility. Um, and I'm not saying that he, he that is kind of his summary, but futility of, of the political situation is very much an energy within the film. So too is absurdity. There's a wonderful and very prescient and, and, and you know, predictive moment in, in the history of people movement and migration where Moretti and his documentary team go down south, I think they're on the coast, and, or they are on the coast, and, um, and they document the arrival of um, a refugee ship from Albania. And we see this huge ship. And these are images we are so familiar with these days, particularly from North Africa into Italy. But what he's doing there is he's documenting this process. Anyway, that he gets, gets together with some of these um, asylum seekers and, and he starts talking to them. And you think, oh, this is maybe a moment where the... Where, uh, Nani's sort of political purpose will come through. And he's asking them these ridiculous questions about, you know, whether as, 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 as asylum seekers, migrants, you know, whether they think that uh, a, a left-wing government is better for them or a right-wing government. And they're just going, what are you talking about? You know, we're, we're just looking for terra firma and somewhere to live free from oppression. And so the kind of whole idea of political absurdity is very strongly part of the film and, and very much recognised within it. In terms of this idea of personal filmmaking, uh, the, the style says it all, and I've, I've preempted this with the relationship of the film to Cato Diario. Um, it is in, in a way kind of um, internally uh, sort of suggested within the film by the kind of constant nagging impre uh, impression that this desire, this unconscious desire perhaps, to make the 50s musical keeps coming back. And, and he's sort of thinking about it, tends to think about it when he doesn't want to think about Berlusconi and who could blame him. Um, but he is, he's, he, it constantly re-emerges 
particularly at the level of the soundtrack. The idea of the 50s music, uh, musical, however, is seen within the context of the film as perhaps something of an indulgence, and indulgence is always a key word in a Nanni Moretti film, God love him, um, but the idea that perhaps, you know, this if we must make the documentary, this idea of the musical is, is a bit of a, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a luxury that perhaps uh, a politically engagé filmmaker can't really afford to make. But in a way, it it leads us to the conclusion of the film and, and perhaps the fusion of all the elements of the film together in the final sort of freedom of the very last scene, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but one, it's one of these kind of last scenes which in many ways echoes uh, Federico Fellini's last scene from Eight and a Half, where everything kind of comes together. And, and in a sense, those two films, Otto e Mezzo and this film, have a, have a lot in common in that they both really address the question of the director's dilemma and, and try to find some way out of that. In terms of the notion of, of personal life and private life, um, again, this is very much a theme and an idea that is um, uh, asserted through the, 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 the slightly documentary diary sort of style of the film and very much backed up by Moretti's own voiceover uh, narration within the film, uh, that the film is very much engaged in, in, in Moretti trying to understand something about his own life. Of course, this leads to an inevitable kind of Woody Allen-esque narcissism and introspection, which we always find amusing, I think, in both cases. Um, but certainly the film leads Nunni's character, and I'm using that word advisedly, leads his persona within the film towards a certain altruism, a certain understanding of the realities of, that are going on around him despite his own narcissism. Definitely his engagement initially with the birth of his son Pietro, and they have wonderful scenes together in the film. Uh, you know, he's starting to sort of look beyond uh, himself and, he, and his own world. And a really very moving scene in the summer with his mother, played by his own mother, um, where he's sort of saying, oh my God, you know, you were a teacher and you had all these responsibilities. How did you get the sort of feeds on demand when the, when I was born. And she said, what feeds on demand? And I fed you before I went to work. I nicked home at lunchtime. You know, th there's a really interesting kind of moment there where he kind of recognises the struggles that his parents had to make, particularly his mother, and then relates that back to his own context. And, and in a sense, I think it's kind of charming when you think about our sort of concerns about helicopter parenting and all this kind of stuff. And it certainly puts the past in a particular context. And he starts to understand some of the realities beyond himself, particularly in relation to his own mother. Certainly the key to the personal life story and in inquiry in this film is Moretti's um, consideration ultimately about quality of life and, and the kind of, you know, um, longevity of life. And, you know, we don't have much time, make the most of it. And, and here we start to see themes that we've seen very much in some of, uh, his, of his other films, you know, make hay while the sun shines. The conclusion of the film, which we reach um, only after about 80 odd minutes, it's a very a delightfully short film. Why does every film have to be five hours? You know, this is a wonderful uh, statement about filmmaking that it doesn't always have to be the same. And, and, and I think this is what Moretti does here. The final scene is of course, again, another, you know, can I say it, iconic film a moment in, in, Italian, in Italian cinema history uh, of the Trotskyite pastry chef dancing to one of the great Perestrado numbers and everyone joins in. And, and, and the, the resolution of the whole film seems to come in this context. Moretti has been contemplating his political commitments and engagements from the past. And after a wonderful Vesper ride throughout the places of his childhood, wearing that, that famous um, director's cape, that he was always too embarrassed to wear and throwing all these letters and political pamphlets out everywhere. He finally arrives at, 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 the, uh, at the, um, the location and, and he realises, and this is a, a realisation that comes to lots of directors and producers, that his film is moving on without him and that he comes to a moment where the, the film ends with this wonderful uh, scene of, of pastry chefs dancing around with in, in beautiful 50s costume with beautiful music. And it seems to bring some sort of 
conclusion or resolution to the whole film, a wonderful tune. And once you've heard it once, you can never really get that out of your mind. What the film, I think, is saying here in many ways, and I hate to reduce these films down to trite little three-point take-home messages, but they can be useful, um, is that I think all these three aspects, politics, personal filmmaking, personal life, are important. And, and, and it's not as if the film ends up on the 50s musical and therefore this film is therefore all about that, that aspect. They are all important aspects and they all have a very strong um, claim on our sense of responsibility and, and what we need to be doing in our lives. They're certainly all interconnected. I talked about the absurdity of the political situations and the absurdity of, of his perception of those. No more absurd or no less absurd than the kind of 50s musical that he's sort of making at the same time. And, and the interaction there is really important. Certainly, uh, Nunny's own narcissism and introspection points to a, a certain absurdity about his own personal behaviour. If the film does say anything to us, I think, and, and of Nunny, it is that perhaps that personal filmmaking and personal life deserve better focus in our experience. Politics, the body politic, um, popular culture have uh, a very easy access to our um, experience because they bombard us from everywhere. And we think that's the case now. I mean, if you look at, at this film, you know, about the middle to late 90s and all these scenes that Moretti uses of, um, there's one scene where he goes to buy all the current uh, riviste, the current journals and magazines, and he, he's just there for, you know, seemingly like an hour, just reeling off all the titles and he's buying them all because he wants to document them. And there are these also wonderful scenes, particularly with his son Pietro, where he's just lying in a sea of political and, 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 and newspaper clippings and just kind of burying himself under this. And, and the point is made, I mean, he may be a political junkie, but I think the point is made that, that the political and the social and the general cultural can get to us so easily. So perhaps in a way, what the film is saying to us that, that we need to make time for the personal and the creative um, and, 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 and perhaps in a sense, from that point of view, we become better political citizens. We become more engaged because we have a much better sense of self, which we can then take to our contexts um, as we engage with the dilemmas of being at least electors once every three or four years in wherever we're based. In a sense, one thing I do like about this beautiful musical moment at the end of the film is that it realises uh, uh, the vision of the film that they were intending to make, which is kind of mentioned in the film by his collaborator, Silvio Orlando, who plays the Trotskyite pastry chef living in a Stalinist world. And he sort of talks about the film and he says, oh yeah, when we were gonna make it before it was, you know, I had this vision about bodies and music and dancing and movement. It's a very pure image of, of you know, what um, Pal and Pressburger would call composed cinema. And this idea of, bodies moving in space and the camera collecting that. And, and it's a very kind of pure sort of image of, of what the cinema does, I think, at its best. And, and in a sense, uh, as an artistic sort of final statement, I think it tells us a lot about this film and it tells a lot about film in general. So I do recommend that you uh, have a, a repeated looks at Aprile. Um, Moretti's still making wonderful films and, and um, if we think about um, more recent films like We Have a Pope, uh, there's a lot of really interesting energy. I think he's one of my favourite filmmakers and if you haven't experienced Moretti, I really encourage you to do so. And I would start with Aprile because I think it will um, change your life for the better. That's it for this episode. Please stand by to join us for our third talk in the series, which is coming up, in which we're going to um, kind of move to Australia, or at least Sydney, and um, we'll be looking at uh, Kate Wood's wonderful film, uh, Looking for Ella Brandy, uh, which came a little bit after April. It's an incredible favourite. Everyone's read it. I think it's the most stolen book from school libraries in the history of Australian uh, education. 
Um, many of you have seen the film. It's a really interesting way of thinking about Italian experience, particularly much closer to home uh, for us and, and particularly in the context of, of Sydney and New South Wales, but there's a lot there for Victorians as well. So I hope you'll join us for our next talk when we drop it. In the meantime, please continue to stay safe and stay distanced. And um, thanks for listening and joining in today. Ciao.